let's go to a uh, MEMS design example together. Uh, this is very high level. I'll just quickly go through the processing steps, you know, how a MEMS designer works uh, to, or thinks about designing a new device and, you know, this evaluation of the performance and all that. And then what do they get at the end of the story once they're done with the design part and have it submitted to a foundry process or they make it in-house. Uh, we are going to do the same thing for some of the examples in the labs and uh, hopefully that's enough for you to get uh, an appreciation of uh, the relative processes or relevant processes. Okay, so in here we have a design example. This device is a magnetic field sensor. It is a multi-domain. Uh, the operation involves multiple domains. We have currents going through the top and bottom crossbars. These currents heat up the structure, so you have electrical effects, you have electrothermal effects. The middle part is an electrostatic resonator, so you have uh, voltages that are coming in to excite the device, and then you have on the left side currents produced because of the movements of the proof mass. So you have electrostatic interfaces at the input and output of this device. It's a nonlinear device, and uh, it's a resonator, so it's actually uh, the dynamic response that is uh, important to us. So it includes a whole bunch of different physical domains and they interact with each other and work with each other. And at the end of the, the story, you want to measure magnetic fields with this device. Now, the MEMS designer that comes up with the idea, they have to think how the device is going to work, what are the components going to look like, and they produce this drawing. This is a 2D drawing, there are multiple levels. So the yellow lines here, for example, are metal, the gray ones are um, uh, silicon, and these uh, drawings that you see here, these uh, basically outlines of the rectangles that you see here are cavities that I etch underneath the parts of silicon that I want to move. So this is the layout, this is called the layout. So basically these are drawings, 2D, each one is corresponding to one etching step in your process flow later on, one layer, one material usually. And uh, I create these drawings, I align them with each other, and I produce this. This is called the layout of a MEMS device. Now, if I have the right tools at my disposal, I can go and take that layout and pass it through a sequence of processing steps that I've come up with and figure out how my device is going to look like if I fabricate it according to those rules. And then in this case, you see that the gray lines or the gray areas that I had here for silicon uh, are now uh, left on the, at the end of the process. So this is obviously a simulation of the process. And these red parts are corresponding to the gray parts in my layout. The yellow parts are the metal lines that I had. And then you can see that the blue substrate that I have is removed in those areas that I want it to be removed. Now, so this is the device. It's important for me to have a look at this in order to figure out, you know, if, I'm, if my layout is correct and sometimes to ensure that my process is doing what I want it to do or the sequence of the steps is, is correct. But now that I have this 3D uh, visualization, I can actually do simulations on it, right? So I go from that 2D drawing, pass it through the processing steps that I have and the sequences as shown before, and I create this 3D structure because of the deposition and removal of the materials in sequence. And I can do all sorts of an analysis here on this structure now. So this, for example, is a finite element uh, model for the structure. I mesh it using the proper mesh type and, and size and all that. And I can look at different responses of this structure. So for example, in here, I look at the response of a device under some electrostatic force. If I apply a voltage to the electrode on the left side, for example, or right side, what happens? You know, it's going to pull the moving part towards itself. And the red means more displacement. So I can see that most of the displacement is happening in the middle of the structure. The rest of it is blue, essentially, uh, not moving. I can also look at the uh, dynamic response of this device and look at you know how it's going to respond at resonance. So this is, for example, the resonant response of the structure. Right, so it goes back and forth. The middle part goes back and forth. That's the first resonant frequency. And in this case, for this device, that's actually 
uh, how I will be using this device. So once I have the finite element model, I can use all these mechanical simulations or even electromechanical or, or multiple physical, multiple domain simulations in order to estimate how my device works. Hopefully I have an analytic model to verify that my simulator is not lying to me or is not fooling me. And then once I have some confidence that everything is going to work well, I have it fabricated through a process. And this is what we get back, right? So this is the device that comes from the manufacturer, from the foundry back to us. You can see that it looks like pretty much the same as what we modeled. A couple of extra electrodes are here for, uh, you know, removing the charge. But at the end of the story, you know, the gray blue areas here are the silicon that we kept on the surface and the yellow is the metal that uh, is taking the signals to and from the device for us. In terms of operation, you can actually uh, have a look at this device under a microscope and see how it works. Uh, let me see. Uh, so, and in this case, what I'm doing is that I'm applying a low frequency signal to this uh, device, a voltage signal to the bottom electrode, let's say, and I'm pulling it up and down. And you can see that about a frequency of one hertz, the dimensions are on the order of microns, as mentioned before. Each one of those fingers that you see here is about two microns wide. And you can see that by applying a voltage to the bottom electrode, I can actually move the middle part, which is free to move. I remove the material underneath up and down. Now, the other thing I do is that this is at one hertz so that your eyes can see it. But if I sweep the frequency from low to high, and this device has a resonant frequency as what we saw in the simulations, I expect to see that resonance peak as well. Now, this is happening at very high frequency, so I don't see the signal, but I see an envelope of the uh, displacement, right? So I, I noticed that, you know, it became blurry at one certain frequency. It means that the amplitude of vibration increased as I expect for a device response under resonance. And then, you know, you have, you can have fun. And then, you know, these videos are online. I provide a link to a website that you can go and have a look at. Uh, mostly promotional at the beginning of the MEMS technology development. You know, they wanted to get people excited about the technology. And, you know, it, this device likely doesn't have that much of a practical use, but it was fun. And then, for example, they uh, tried to have, a bit of, to have a bit of fun with poor mite here. So might are tiny, tens of microns to hundreds of microns, and then you can see that you know, they're considered monsters to components of these micro machines. Uh, now, MEMS is amazing. There's a ton of things that you can do with it, but where do we seek a MEMS solution? Uh, it's a very expensive process. You know, if you want to have a, your own MEMS device in the market, if you go and use a process that is provided by a foundry, you need at least about 100K to $200,000 uh, just to have your processes, you know, have a few wafers through the process and so that you get your devices back and can test them. So that's just the very beginning if the process is simple, if a foundry is willing to, to work with a small company, that's how much they're going to charge you to, to uh, give you a few wafers of test devices, you know, it's not production yet. And then add to that all the money that you have to spend on, you know, personnel and testing and other facilities. So it's not going to be cheap. A MEMS solution, you know, the MEMS chip at the end is going to be 50 cents or 20 cents, but creating that process and having it fabricated through a, a proper foundry is not going to be cheap. Where do we want to have a MEMS solution? Well, the first part is when the market size is large. Right? So if you have millions of customers or tens of millions of customers or hundreds of millions of customers, for example, in case of cell phones, uh, and you have a solution that those customers need, it's, it's worth it to seek a MEMS solution. Right? So IoT is the latest example that you're expecting to have billions of these devices around you. And so therefore, develop MEMS solutions for that market. It's a huge market, so batch fabrication pays off. Sometimes you have restrictions, practical restrictions, that means that you have to use a miniaturized system. You cannot use macroscale devices or serially made devices. And an example of that is scanning probe microscopy, where you have a sharp tip that you move it on a surface, 
Uh, movements of this tip will tell you something about the topography or maybe different types of forces on that surface. Uh, because you're dealing with nanometer scales and then smaller, you have to have a device that is on the same scale. So there's really no other alternative in, in a case like that. Sometimes you have a solution already, but it costs too much, and you want to find an alternative that is lower cost provided that the market is there. So accelerometers is an example. So a, um, you have large scale, macro scale uh, accelerometers that actually outperform MEMS devices in many cases, but they're so expensive that limit their use. So if you go back to the early 90s, the accelerometer that was used in crash uh, detection in some of the luxury systems cars back then was about $350, uh, and then you actually often needed more than one. And then MEMS companies, by developing a MEMS alternative to that system, they sold it at about 50 bucks. They did the same job, and actually the system was more reliable. Uh, so the lower cost alternative to that main system that already existed actually uh, let them capture the market. And then on the other hand, let them be deployed in any car, not just luxury cars. Sometimes it is the power that limits you. Sometimes it is the power that... Uh, necessitates using smaller systems, miniaturized systems. Miniature systems usually because of their smaller mass, their smaller dimensions, their smaller volume, consume less power to operate. Not always, but in, in most cases that's the case. And for example, in wireless sensor nodes in IoT, you need those kinds of devices because a lot of the operations are uh, run based uh, off batteries. And in some cases, not always, MEMS offers significantly better performance. So you go and miniaturize a device because you gain performance. And MEMS microphones is one example uh, of, of such a system. You had microphones. You know, typical microphones are cheap. They're batch fabric, mass fabric manufactured in huge quantities. But when MEMS microphones came along, they did a few things that the regular microphone could not do. For example, they could detect the direction of the sound, so therefore you could have better noise cancellation. They could be integrated with interface electronics and some signal processing, and therefore it would simplify the system design, something that a, an electric microphone, for example, could not do. So even though an electric microphone would, could have been cheaper, and maybe almost you know, in, after packaging about the same size, it could not offer the functionality that you could get out of a MEMS microphone. And so MEMS microphones are basically replacing traditional microphones in almost every application. And sometimes you need an integrated mother uh, microsystem for reasons from other than that. So for example, in RF MEMS, you want to have filters, 10 filters, 20 filters for different frequency bands uh, that are basically as small as possible. You want to put it in a cell phone. And therefore, MEMS offers you uh, a way to integrate such a functionality in a small volume. Now, if you go back to the timeline of MEMS inventions, as we said, the first MEMS device was actually made in the 60s. You know, as soon as people figured out you know, there's mechanical things you can do at these small scales, they put it to use. They made the resonant gate uh, transistor back in, I think, 65 it was. Uh, and then in this case, what they have is a beam that is made of gold, and they had an electrode underneath this beam. They could pull it up and down. And if you do it right, your beam can have a high uh, quality factor, basically low damping, and you can make a, crystal os a, a, a uh, mechanical oscillator out of this, which is needed in a lot of timing applications. So this was done back in 67. However, the technology was immature. So what happened is that when they made, uh, let's say, a thousand of these or a hundred of these on the wafer, the thickness of the gold uh, film that you made the beam from varied from a corner of wafer to another. Uh, the, um, um, let's say, dimensions could not be controlled that well. The gaps could not be controlled that well. And because of that, the performance was not uniform. There was a large variation between the performance of different uh, devices, so it couldn't be commercialized, and people abandoned the idea for a good 20 years. But later on in the 
late 80s, early 90s, came back to the, well, they, they kept developing the technologies, but they started to realize the potential uh, that existed in the 80s and 90s, and basically the field exploded. Accelerometers were developed early on. It's a relatively uh, simple MEMS device because you're measuring an inertial force. It can be, you know, the device can be, uh, at least uh, from the mechanical point of view, sealed from the environment. It doesn't have to be in touch with anything, so it's easier to protect them. Uh, accelerometers were among the first devices that were developed. Pressure sensors, same thing. Again, as long as you provide a, an opening to the environment, you could seal the rest of it and, and protect the rest of the device. And there was a need for pressure sensors at small scales. So accelerometers and pressure sensors uh, were among the first devices to be developed and used because there was a need for both. Pressure sensors are still widely used in you know, all sorts of applications ranging from automotive to even your cell phones and, and wearables. And soon after that, we figured out how to measure angular rate. So these are gyroscopes that we uh, figured out to uh, design methods to measure the uh, angular rate. And you know, with a gyroscope and an accelerometer, in many cases, you can do a very good job in terms of you know, vibration isolation and vibration compensation. So that's what you use in a lot of uh, optical systems, you know, cameras. Uh, and you can also, to some extent, use them for navigation. Then people started to put the MEMS and electronics together. You know, this idea came about from the beginning, said, you know, you're using the microelectronics processes to make these mechanical devices. Anyways, build a circuit next to it. And since the beginning, people were looking into this. So here's an example from early 80s on a humidity sensor that had its electronic circuit right next to it. And then you have RF MEMS devices that are gaining, or they were a subject of intense research in the 2000s and maybe 2000, early 2010s, and now are deployed everywhere in, as part of, for example, your cellular network or any other telecommunication device that you're using. Uh, a lot of them are resonators, but you're also making switches, RF switches based on MEMS devices. And the reason that you choose an RF switch uh, that is MEMS-based over one that is transistor-based is insertion losses are much smaller for MEMS switches. They're essentially relays. Uh, and also the isolation is much better for a MEMS switch. You know, you basically disconnect two conductors from each other. You don't get a better isolation than that. Optical MEMS is still a large field. You know, it's still used in projectors. Once you hopefully come back to, to the campus, the projectors that we have in our lecture rooms are using one of these digital micromirror devices. And you have a million of these mirrors working in parallel to project an image onto a screen for you. And then we have lab on chip. And these are microfluidic systems that you use in order to do some sort of a chemical or biological analysis. Now, by integrating multiple agents, multiple cavities, multiple uh, reagents onto the, uh, or chambers onto a chip, you can have a lab on a chip. So you can do multiple analysis, you know, do all sorts of analysis for different, uh, let's say, target uh, molecules or biomarkers that you're looking for on one chip. And not only you're doing multiple tests at once, but you're also using less of the agents or samples, which is important. Also, because the surface area to volume goes up as you scale down these devices, the action times are much faster, so you don't really have to wait too long for things to happen. There are some challenges, of course, and there's really nothing free, but uh, if we have time, we'll cover some of the challenges regarding the microfluidic aspects by the end of the course. Now, regarding the design of the MEMS, you know, at the beginning, it was a lot of it was based on hand calculations, you know, mechanical uh, knowledge of mechanical systems, beams and plates, and so on and so forth. Then uh, we started to use general purpose finite element solvers like ANSYS, like COMSOL. And then, you know, in the late 90s, uh, specific purpose, uh, purpose MEMS uh, CAD were developed to our IntelliSuit and uh, Coventor. Uh, these are well-established uh, software in MEMS industry, and uh, we are going to use Coventor in this course for the first two labs which lets you design a process, 
draw a layout and see what happens if you process that layout in the uh, you know, process flow that you designed. So what happens if you take the layout and process it according to your steps and you create a 3D structure at the end of that process that you can actually do all sorts of simulations on it. Um, MEMSCAD terminology, so I've listed a few here. This is in your slides. You can go and have a look at them later. I don't want to go through all of that. But the thing to remember is that uh, we are making material, we are carving devices out of these deposited layers of materials or the substrate. Uh, you have a moving part, but it has to be connected to something fixed. So we call the location where the moving part is connected to the fixed substrate, we call it an anchor. So this is probably one that you should remember. Uh, and then all the connections are beams, all the materials are, you know, every piece of the, I would say 99.99% .99 of cases, you don't have gaps between different moving parts, everything is made of a single piece of material. Uh, and it, in that regard, it looks like, or it is somewhat similar to CNC machining, that you remove the material that you need from a block of the material, and the rest of it is all one uniform piece of material. Now, in Coventurware, as I mentioned, you have the opportunity to design the process, actually even simulate the process if you're interested, and draw the layout for your device, create the 3D structure, do all sorts of simulations. And now they have added the capability to Coventor where that it creates a model that you can actually take to MATLAB and then simulate all sorts of, let's say, control algorithms on it. Or you can take it to Cadence and integrate your MEMS device in an electronic circuit design environment and do, for example, all sorts of noise and nonlinearity analysis on it. So it's a very capable project, uh, CAD tool, but we are going to focus on a relatively uh, small subset of the capabilities here. We are going to use the process design and implementation part as well as the layout. We do some simple uh, simulations in the second lab, and I think that hopefully gives you enough uh, information about how the whole MEMS design process works. So that's it for today.